I received hundreds of emails from people who have been harmed sexually, psychologically, and emotionally from members of Alcoholics Anonymous. I would like to make AA safer for people. I tried to make AA safer. We put on the first Make AA Safer workshop and we outed a rapist. And it empowered people to come forward and talk about other problems that were going on in AA besides sexual predation. Another district committee member wanted to put on another event, Make AA Safer workshop, and they really shut her down. And she said, why? And they said, well, it'll scare people and people you know, will think that A isn't safe. And she said, well, it isn't. with helping recovering alcoholics. Now 7 News learning this AA leader is charged with betraying that trust. Police say he attacked a woman who was seeking help with recovery. The trusted confidant of the woman says she was left traumatized and police admit that they fear she's not alone. My name is Sasha Mendez and my sister Carla Brada was murdered on September 1st, 2011 by a man that she met in an AA meeting. I left AA because Christine and Sandra Cass were murdered. And they were murdered by a man who was court ordered by a judge and the healthcare professionals, two alcoholics anonymous. He was violent, they knew it. And she had eight years sober, beautiful 40 year old educated woman, and her 13 year old daughter were murdered by this guy. And I said, that's it, I've had enough. I don't wanna be a part of this. step is a euphemism for sexual harassment in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's when an older member who knows exactly what they're doing preys on a new person for sex or for financial gain. It's all you have to do to be worshipped just to have a lot of sobriety. Even if it's not true, you just say, I've got 30 years and everybody says, wow, awesome, you know, you've been touched by God and this made you a very worthy human being. And guys have used that uh, to abuse uh, younger women consistently. I was quite frankly shocked. You did experience something that you want people to be aware of. Well, what I want people to know is that you might be sitting next to Aunt Sally, who's a teacher, or to Johnny, who's a normal guy, but the other guy might be a pedophile and a criminal. So what's happening is that the judicial system is sentencing violent offenders and sex offenders to AA meetings unknown to the public and unknown to AA members right now. Were you aware that they are uh, court ordering sex offenders and violent offenders to AA meetings as part of plea deals? No, I didn't know that. That's a little uh, frightening. If you have a court order uh, that needs to be signed, you can just drop it in the basket and I will sign it and get it to you after the meeting. 60 to 80 percent of the people in groups today are coerced people. They're sent there by the drug courts, they're sent there by the probation officers, uh, they're sent there by the treatment centers. I've seen things change in my lifetime in the fellowship since the court slip started coming into the meetings. My husband was charged as a sex offender 18 years ago, and he was court ordered Alcoholics Anonymous, and he didn't drink. The only thing I've ever heard out of anybody's mouth in the courtroom is AA. But the purpose of the justice system is to um, create safe environments for the public. Number one issue is to keep the public safe. Taking people and ordering them to go to AA, especially women, in my opinion, women and young girls, um, putting them in AA is extremely unsafe. What I found was that registered sex offenders were being allowed to work as counselors. It's an unequal relationship in terms of power, and people who are sex offenders, many of them have, have shown a propensity for exploiting those kinds of relationships. And so it seemed like a uniquely unsuitable background for a counselor. One case in particular was a woman who had a long history of, uh, of theft type offenses, and she became a counselor, and she proceeded to steal $50,000 from a client. It's not just sex offenses. You might want to screen counselors for um, other types of offenses. 
I know one person in the valley here who's been ripped off by another member to the tune of $30,000. The view is uh, we don't report people like that. It's some sort of ingrained culture that says, you know, they're not really responsible. That's what alcoholics do. I found a doctor in Redlands who um, had been convicted of prescribing drugs to people he'd never met, including people who were addicted to drugs. And uh, he was, he lost his medical license and then he became a drug counselor. KF was convicted of 110 counts of lewd acts upon a child in 1995. After he molested four children, he was babysitting in three separate families. The children ranged in age from an infant to a nine-year-old. I think it's despicable that the courts are knowingly sentencing violent sex offenders and violent criminals to go to AA meetings. You know, they're knowingly putting these people into rooms where they know that there's just tons of vulnerable people. My first drink was when I was 12 years old. I'll never forget the first time I got really drunk and, and realized that I liked alcohol. It was in a sleepaway camp. And it was nighttime. We all went back to our cabins, and these kids pulled out these bottles of vodka that they brought back from home. The problem really began when I went to college, and I joined a fraternity. And part of the ritual of becoming a brother of the fraternity is to drink an enormous amount of alcohol, an enormous amount. I was using to the point where I was getting sick and I was tired of being dope sick all the time, being broke all the time. Um, I had overdosed repeatedly amount of times, and I knew if I didn't stop using and drinking, I was gonna die. Hello everyone, welcome to the Saturday afternoon Venice meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Joyce and I'm an alcoholic. Hi Joyce. I'm Char and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hi Char. Char. I didn't know where we were going that night, but he asked if we wanted to go to some meeting with him. It only lasted an hour and be in and out. And I went in there and actually half of my friends were in there for drug court. I thought we were all just hanging out. <laughs> I didn't know what was really going on. Hey, congratulations. And it seemed like fun to go to co-ed meetings and meet more people. I thought that everyone in the rooms who had multiple years of sobriety, they were there for my best interests. AA started as an outgrowth of the Oxford Group, which was a fundamentalist religious organization. It started in the 19th century. The belief system of the Oxford Group was the sins and the problems of man are due to not being close enough to God. Bill Wilson, who founded AA, was a member of the Oxford Group, and he was very smart about media. And so he knew that he had to modify the, the words in the group to appeal to a wider audience. So God became a higher power, even though the word God is in five different steps. And he went out of his way to say the higher power can be anything you want it to be. It can be a doorknob, as they often say in AA. When AA was established in 1935, it entered a vacuum in the United States. Prohibition had just ended a couple of years before. There was no treatment system. There were no mutual help groups of significance. It takes rhythm. Let's go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It was kind of the Wild West. Alcoholics Anonymous and other organizations combating alcoholism are gaining ground, bringing to the public a sense of the true nature of the problem through such spokesmen as the director of the National Committee for Education on Alcoholism, Mrs. Marty Mann. Alcoholism has too long been a taboo subject, just as tuberculosis used to be 40 years ago. We're trying to teach people the truth that alcoholism is a disease, and that because it is a disease, it should have no stigma attached to it. 
Alcoholics should be dealt with like other sick persons, in hospitals and clinics, not in jails. It starts with the belief that addiction is a chronic, progressive, fatal disease which you will die from unless you get treatment and go to 12-step meetings. For it to be categorized as a disease, I think, is somewhat of a stretch. Um, in my mind, I put uh, alcoholism and dependence more as a um, personality disorder than a disease. My concern with the term disease, however, really is from how the patients perceive it. Not all, but a, a subset of people who are alcoholics and are said that they have a disease tend to hide behind that term and use that as an excuse and not tackle their problems head on. AA told me that I had an incurable progressive disease that was always doing push-ups, meaning it was always getting worse even when I wasn't drinking. It really did a number on me. Of course it's not a disease. A disease is something like polio or emphysema. I did a research project on it in high school, uh, whether or not alcoholism was in fact a disease because I noticed that people called it a disease a lot, but it didn't share the characteristics of any diseases. A behavior cannot be a disease because there's something that causes the behavior. Alcoholism is a behavior. It's not a disease. The bottle does not open itself up and pour itself into your mouth. It's not how it works. What I want people to know about these rooms is that it's a concentrated pod of dysfunction. I walked out of every single AA meeting feeling like a piece of crap. Like, you know, why isn't this working for me? Here are the steps we took. I began to see it as bad theater. You know, hideous drama queen stuff. I was tired of hearing about people saying, I wrecked my car, and then someone else said, well, I wrecked three cars. And someone else would say, I wrecked three cars and killed five people. How about 90 days? It was emotionally upsetting for me to go to a meeting. And I left, and the sponsor I had told me I had to come back inside and sit there. He said, you need to get used to it. He said, if you're going to be in AA, you need to, like, toughen up and, you know, that kind of thing. Sometimes a good surgeon will say, I'm sorry, I don't recommend the kind of operation I do for you because it won't help you. AA never says that. But that's a serious deficit if you're going for treatment for a major problem. They don't know when they are inappropriate. When you truly enter a 12-step fellowship, the idea is that I recognize that I will never be capable by myself of solving this problem. And I will always need a sponsor, a group, and a higher power in order to do it. When I went to these places, my sense was I was going to have to live among this population for the rest of my life. I was going to meetings daily. Everybody was telling me if I don't go to meetings every day, I'm going to end up using. I'm going to end up back on the street. I'm going to end up uh, going to prison again. What we say repeatedly, the addiction is not you. And what does AA say? The first thing you have to say is, I am an alcoholic. You have to declare. They tell you to live in the real world. Okay, in the real world, it's illegal to do what they're doing in AA. They're not above the law. So people think that AA is a special secret something. What is that? It's not. It's a 501c3. It's a nonprofit corporation that has to follow all the rules, like everybody else, like the Boy Scouts, like the Catholic Church. They know that they need to change things because there are parents that are suing Alcoholics Anonymous for wrongful death. Mendez and my sister Carla Brada was murdered on September 1st 2011 by a man that she met in an AA meeting. His name was Eric Allen Earl. He pretty much found out that she owned a condominium, she had a brand new car and she had an excellent job and of course the main thing was for him that she had a 401k. <laughs> He would always sit next to her. He would never let anybody get close to her. He's saying that he has no money, no place to go. And so Carla took him in to stay with her. 
and exactly four months later, she was dead. I was the mama and the papa. Every day I take her to the park for many years, for many years. Now I take my dogs. Killer of my daughter, he has 20 years. He is still is drinking and is uh, aggressive and he killed my daughter. This is his criminal record and it started in 1206, 1991. This is his first charges okay. for his criminal record. And what was it for? And this Vandalism. was assault and battery and vandalism. Yeah, so know. one time a week at an AA meeting or one year in jail. Mm -hmm. He has a 22 year long record. He has eight restraining orders on him, including his ex-wife. He has been sent 52 times to AA meetings through the court system, by the courts. Instead of a jail time, they are being sent to these AA meetings where they prey on young people. With this particular case, the only way AA is going to make any changes or even get their attention to make changes is to file a lawsuit against them. And, um, and if a jury tells them that they need to change the way they're doing business, then they will. In uh, 2009, we got a letter from someone in California saying this sort of abuse, predatory abuse, has to be stopped and I want to know what position Alcoholics Anonymous has on it. And I learned we don't have a position. Every group is autonomous. We take no responsibility for those things at all. And we're not going to speak out about it. It's unbelievable that she's no longer with us. I mean, I still can't get over it. Destroyed our family completely. And do take an example from this and do not allow your children to be taken to, to any rehab or any, any AA meetings unless, unless you are sure that they're safe there. I've had depression issues since I was a teenager. I kind of already was the type of person that lived my life like I had no control over it. And then when I went to AA, it was a reinforcement of that powerlessness. This hill ain't nothing to a climber, nothing to a climber, no. I did not feel powerless when I initially had been using drugs problematically. It was only once I started going to rehabs and other treatment programs that I started to feel powerless. My sponsor told me that my medication was, I was using it as a crutch and that it was just an excuse. I have seen people commit suicide in Alcoholics Anonymous because they were told not to take their medications that they wouldn't be clean and sober. They take away your dignity and your pride and your self-esteem and your confidence. And then they would say, you have to say the first step or you're going to die. You know, say, take what you like and leave the rest. And you say, I don't like the first step. Well, if you don't do the first step, you're going to die. So you have to do it. Uh, well, I, mean, I mean, it's your choice. It's like suggesting you put on a parachute before you jump out of a plane. It's merely a suggestion. But you'll die if you don't do it. I was sitting with my girlfriend on a couch. She really liked drinking champagne. and She had a champagne flute in her hand. I just reached over. I took one sip and I gave it back to her. And I sort of sat back because I literally had no idea what was about to happen, right? For the last three years of my life, I've been hearing that if I use anything, I'm gonna be right back to where I started, right? It was a progressive disease. Once it got to a certain point, it was never gonna go back and all this sort of stuff. I didn't know if I was gonna go back to smoking meth the next day or a week later or anything like that, but nothing happened. How do you know when you've hit bottom? That's the first problem because people hit what might be a bottom for some, meaning they are then going to seek help. Um, and they think they're at the bottom, but then, whoops, here comes another bottom and another bottom. You only can know what was your bottom looking backwards. It's as if you're there saying, you are so stupid that until you get it into your thick head that you have suffered enough, you're not going to get well. But that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> See?
I was at a meeting one night and after the meeting I was talking with a man. I had known him for three years and we were talking about having coffee and he said, well, I'm going to bed early tonight. Why don't you just come over and have a cup of tea? I went over to his house and he put a date rape drug in my tea and then he assaulted me. I went to a meeting and I told someone about it and I was crying and she was yelling at me saying, you need to figure out your part in this. It's your fault, you drank the tea. And she was saying that I needed to put down on paper the reasons why it was my fault and that I needed to admit that to myself and to another human being and to God and that I needed to ask God for forgiveness and for God to take away those defects from me. I felt so unbelievably betrayed because I was a complete devotee or devotee of AA. If there was ever a cult member, it was me. And I couldn't believe that people would treat me this way. I couldn't believe that people would protect this man. I started to read the book and think, none of this is true. It was just an incredible sense of betrayal by a spiritual community. What it looked like was just everybody was hitting on everybody all the time. If you have 20 years of sobriety and you act like an idiot, well, that's okay because you've got 20 years of sobriety. And when this woman did that to me and she had 20 years of sobriety, uh, I thought, what kind of a person would do that? And I, I learned that she went out and did that to other guys, and she had done that to other, guy, other guys before me. I know friends of mine that are down there doing stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and the newcomers come in and they just pounce on them. They're not raping them, mm -hmm. but they're just jumping on them. And the problem there is, is that the person who has sobriety has the advantage, mm -hmm. where the person coming in has no idea what's actually going on. It's like putting gas on fire, you know, it's just, you know, and these guys come to these meetings and it's, for them, it's like fishing out of a barrel. I mean, they're just looking for the, the easiest victim and they, and they take them. I have had dozens of women, primarily, that have come and said they had a sexual assault of some sort in, through AA. They come in almost with a dual diagnosis of uh, the, the alcohol or drug problem and PTSD or, or assault issues. In reality, what we're talking about is predators. We're talking about people who take advantage of people who are in their most vulnerable moment. It's almost impossible to say no <laughs> to someone who wants to be in a relationship with you, mm -hmm. or even a friendship with you, when you're in that vulnerable position. Yeah, I, don't know. I have no clue. Yeah. There were a bunch of guys in the back talking to each other, bragging about the fact that they had convinced a newcomer to go off of her psychiatric medication and into a manic state. And when she was in that state, they all took turns with her. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. One of my tasks when I was in medical school was to actually attend an, an AA general meeting. It actually was striking to see how involved religion is. It tends to alienate those people who would otherwise want to seek help. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It was insisted that I got to believe in God or a higher power, but I didn't see a difference between the two in any way. I was getting arrested. I was going to jail. Bad things were happening, and so, you know, I wanted some kind of solution. 
being told, uh, you know, you, you have to surrender to God and I don't believe in God, it just makes it impossible. I have a really strong sense of who I am and I'm not a bad person. And for somebody to tell me that I failed at something because I didn't connect to my higher being well enough, I want to tell them to take a hike, really. I mean, that was an insult to me. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. The twelfth step of AA is the proselytizing step. We will go out and spread the word to others. When you proselytize, you're trying to have people join in. It has a similar feel to it as the idea that we are always right. We in AA know the true path, and although our ideas started in the 1930s, nothing has new has changed. Nothing has changed to make us change our ideas in the last 75 years. My youngest son was a victim of a sexual assault when he was four years old by a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in Lemon Grove, California. How is he doing now? <sighs> my youngest son is the strongest, most brave young man I've ever met in my life. Um, my, my son, he, he struggles. He, he has a bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, and he lives on the streets of San Diego and he's 24 years old. Listen, if you need anything at all, I'd love to help you work the steps and... The reason I think it happens, it's this whole sponsorship system. It's set up that, hey, you gotta find somebody that knows it all and you gotta do what they say because you're a dummy. Your best thinking got you here. You know, you've heard that. Mm -hmm take the cotton out of your ears and stick it in your mouth. You don't know how to think for yourself, so shut up and listen to somebody else. In some cases you hear about these sponsors, you have people coming over to their homes and mowing, making them mow their lawns or wash their cars or whatever uh, in an effort to quote unquote humble them. The seventh tradition states that we are self-supporting through our own contributions and it's time to pass the basket. People need to be aware that you know what you're getting for your buck in the basket, you may not want. And yes, maybe I'm breaking traditions, but you know what? I have no son because nobody regarded those traditions 10 years ago. So I didn't understand why she was telling me she couldn't give me a character reference for somebody that's sponsoring my 13-year-old son. Maybe she should have told me the fact that she knew he was on the run on pedophile charges under a different name. So if you'd call the law any other time, do us all a favor. Call the law. Call the law. woman with a young child, maybe three years old, successful couple, and the wife goes into AA to try and find help with her alcohol issues. Unfortunately, she met one individual that um, basically seduced her, broke up the marriage, and molested her daughter for maybe eight to ten years. Now how does that happen? Well, I don't know how that all happens, but I know that I was that little girl. So, 
I look at my experience and I look at how easy it can be for a young, successful couple, young, successful family to get completely broken up by a predator that is in the program. There are six men who have come together and they fund what is called the Weston Token Club here in Louisville, Kentucky, and it's a clubhouse that hosts meetings Monday through Sunday, all day, on the hour. The man who harmed me, he actually facilitates that meeting. He speaks real good stuff and draws you in. And we casually began to speak. He would say hi and, Brittany, I love you. If nobody's told you today they love you, I do. I'm gonna pray for you. I've seen you come in and out. If you ever need help with recovery, you know, we'll sit down and go get coffee. I'll buy you coffee, we'll sit down with our big books and we'll go through it. One day I was in a meeting and he approached me and gave me a pen that you clicked and it had nothing but recovery quotes on it and gave me a card that said he loved me and would always be there for me and that I need to put my recovery first. But what he meant was he wanted me to put him first. He wanted to be my higher power. He began to buy my cigarettes, and he began to supply me with dope, a $500 a day habit. And I got kicked out of the halfway house for getting high. So when I got kicked out, he told me that I could come live with him, because I had nowhere to go. And so I did. I packed all my stuff, and I moved in with him and he pretty much locked me in the house, fed my dope habit, and I became a slave. Sexually, physically, mentally, cooking, cleaning. He would never come out and ask for sex. He would force it and pretty much tell me, I'm doing this for you, you're gonna do what I want you to do. You have nowhere to go. What the hell are you gonna do? Nobody wants you. Nobody. I'm all you have. The 12 traditions. One, our common welfare should come first Personal recovery depends on AA unity. When you take it to the next level, even to a group, they say you can't tell the members how to act. The reason that I think people don't go to the police is the whole idea of anonymity. That they think they can't go and tell anybody who they knew there, who they met there. He started with saying that he had to make an amends and he apologized that he took on the job as president because he said, some of you may not know this, but I'm a sexual predator. I took on the job to ask pretty young little things, you know, to interview them and hire them. Some of you may or may not know, Darlene has four daughters. Well. I've been praying Darlene dead. I've been going to these holy grounds, pretending to be somebody that I'm not, telling her that I love her. And if I pray her dead, then I had a hopes that I can console and comfort and yes, sexually be with one of her children. many problems with rehabs. But the very first problem is that if you are basing your program on a treatment that we know has a 5 to 10 percent success rate, you're going to have a 5 to 10 percent success rate. 
Some of these programs offer energy transfer therapy. I can't explain it because it's mysticism. Some of them uh, offer horse therapy. Hello, I'm Mr. Red. The idea being, be around a horse and that will help your addiction. No evidence for that, but you can be sure you're paying for it. When you pay that much money, it adds to a problem that AA and the rehab share. Namely, AA is never wrong, and the rehabs are never wrong according to them. So if you drop out of AA, it's never AA's fault, they say. It's your fault. Stick with the program. Do 90 meetings in 90 days. Get back into it. If you go to a rehab and you fail, no one says the rehab is no good. They say, you failed. You failed. Go back in for another round. The most famous cases, of course, are the famous cases, the celebrities, people who go in 10, 12 times to a rehab. You never hear people say the rehab is no good. It's always the person has failed. Actually, what it is is that the rehab is no good. They're giving treatment that just doesn't work. I think it, it all boils down to money. It fuels a, a system where everybody gets paid along the way. And you see Carla brought his name here, and you see a charging of $1,000 a day. My daughter, Carla, paid total $43,000 for that rehab, for the Action Family Rehab, where she was afterwards end up dead. Alcoholics Anonymous has been embedded with the judicial system for a long time. It got into the prisons way back in the 1940s. They started to put books into prison cells and have meetings there. They think that it's a government program because the state will send you there. And not just for drinking violations, for sexual abuse violations, for violent crime violations. They'll send you to Alcoholics Anonymous. AA does not provide any warning signs, any, anything that will tell you that you are sharing the meetings with, with criminals. Just like the California system, where if you get a DOI, you go into a 12-step program. Same thing in medicine, same thing with attorneys. Anybody carrying a certificate in California, I think, is going into the same program. So it is, it's huge. The state of California is willing to be manipulated by Alcoholics Anonymous, and they appear to be in control of, of their disciplinary program and their program to make medical judgment on physicians and looks like attorneys and uh, other professionals based on principles that appear to be completely bogus. I actually thought that AA was led by trained professionals, that they had some sort of credentials, that they had some sort of training. It's a fellowship of lay people. There's no one in charge. There is no social worker running any meeting. And a rapist, a pedophile, or your teacher, or Ann Sally, could be the secretary or your sponsor. It is the case that just about every other healthcare counseling profession as a state board that licenses or certifies them. And they all do criminal background checks. I mean, veterinarians have to undergo criminal background checks. Acupuncturists have to undergo criminal background checks, but not drug and alcohol counselors. My finding was that the only thing you have to do to become registered as a counselor and to start working as a counselor is to pass a TB test. There is no training. There is no background check. There is no facilitator. There is no social worker leading an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Hi, I'm Bonnie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hi Bonnie. If you watch television or you watch film, sometimes they do depict meetings honestly. Okay, Brandon, you want to tell us something about yourself? But I've seen a lot of big A-list shows where they make it look like they have this big circle and they have a guy sitting there and like he's, he's a facilitator. Well, that's a lie. You think you're sunk. You think you're through. Well, you're not. You may not be able to help yourself. There are plenty of us to help you, if you really want us to. It's almost like people who are losers are telling you, we want you to be like us. They couldn't really achieve much except maybe come up from a state of drunkenness or, you know, a loss of control. And now that they're normal, they, they, they feel like they have something to tell people. I've been doing this for, for 30 years. They have this structure where your authority figures are only authority figures by dint of the fact that they've been doing this for a long time. Let me just say I've chosen to walk away with my head held high.
The reason I created my first YouTube video was I wanted to have a forum where I could tell my story, where I could tell what happened to me from going to AA, and I knew I could never do that in AA. It's just about taking responsibility for your life. I had learned that you couldn't challenge their way of thinking. You couldn't say something that was against the, the AA dogma. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Years ago, the field seems to have decided that AA is the best way to treat addiction. And unfortunately, <clears throat> because uh, the scientific community has seemed to accept that, the general population has, and it is the de facto treatment for addiction in this country. Alcoholics Anonymous is even being promoted on the WhiteHouse.gov website. There are so many different tools for people to use, and there are so many different ways of looking at this problem. that we, I think we just need to move as far away as we possibly can from this fake, false notion that there's one way to do this, there's one way to get better, and if you don't follow that prescription, then you're doomed for failure. In 28 years, I've sponsored 175 men. Only seven have made it to the 12 steps. One out of 25. The rest drink. The rest, they go back out. I think we need to broaden our net a little bit to help other people. Smart Recovery, Self-Management and Recovery Training, is a nonprofit organization which helps people gain independence from any type of addiction the goal is to manage the problem myself rather than completely and forever turning it over to a higher power. At this point, I attend a program called Smart Recovery, and it's based on cognitive behavioral psychology, and it kind of gets to the roots of why someone chooses to drink. I'm in Smart Recovery online. I really love the safety of that. After my AA experience, I didn't want to go to any meetings of any organization. The plan is that you develop your life to such an extent that you no longer need a recovery plan, you just have a life plan. Moderation management is approved by the City of Los Angeles, the State of California. If you get a DUI in locally, you're mandated to go to self-help groups and moderation management now can sign court cards and satisfy their legal state requirements. For a first offender, moderation management is a perfect fit. It's a time where they can sort out, are they really problematically destined to have a problem with alcohol, or can they learn tools and techniques to uh, resolve it and move on? For about four years, I was online director for moderation management. And while I was working there, I heard about harm reduction programs. We started developing a harm reduction program within moderation management with a lot of people who were very heavy drinkers, but they were finding ways to improve. We help you make the changes that you choose to make for yourself. The Sinclair method is basically pharmacological extinction. If you have a learned behavior, how do you unlearn it? So what they do with the Sinclair method is they use a opiate blocker. The only way it really works is if you take the naltrexone and an hour later have a drink. And then those endorphins come up, they get blocked and the neural pathways get weakened. So the extinction process starts. Pharmacological extinction has been known for many, many decades. Um, and it's just undoing a learned behavior. SOS stands for Secular Organizations for Sobriety, or Save Ourselves, or uh, SOS. I started SOS out of my own pain and frustration from having attended and stopped attending uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Hello, I'm writing to inquire for any meetings in the San Diego area. I'm required to attend self-help meetings. I'm an atheist and cannot hear bear the thought of having to attend an AA meeting. Alcoholics Anonymous should come with a warning label today. You may get ripped off you may get sexually exploited. They need to make it safer. There are easy ways. 
They could send out a letter. They could tell them, you must have Make A Safer workshops in every district. They need a hotline so that when someone gets harmed, they could call that hotline. And then somebody who's a paid employee from New York needs to go to those, go to those clubhouses and they need to say, you need to cut it out. You can't just keep doing what they're doing and get away with it. It's not okay. It's against the law what's going on in Alcoholics Anonymous. And somebody needs to speak out and make changes. Hi, I'm Jason, and I'm free from Alcoholics Anonymous. These people look at it like this is normal, that it's okay. It's like a secret society, and they, they're all aware of what they do, and it's okay. It's an important issue. This is a situation that has uh, been occurring on a more regular basis throughout the country, and uh, it's very concerning. And I think somebody has to take the case to bring it to the attention of the public and basically stop what's happening within AA. I know that since I've been gone, they're probably sitting around talking about how I'm I'm drinking and I'm going to drink and die and I'm living this miserable alcoholic life and I just want people who might be watching this or listening to this to know that I'm free. Okay. So I've created workshops in California and I feel a freedom like I have never ever felt oh, yeah, yeah. being gone from AA free from AA, free from the thinking. Just wants to talk to her about making AA safer. I realized that I was never broken, that I didn't have a disease, and that I had been hoodwinked. I'm sorry about that. I'm gonna have, we're, they're trying to get someone. Oh, to well, you know, I was wondering guys. if I could just talk to Phyllis Halliday and meet her. Um, Can you call her and she's see? She's currently in a meeting right now. Okay, uh, could you let her know Monica Richardson? It's gonna take more than my film to change things, but it's a start, you know? It's the beginning. We were told that you might stop by, mm -hmm. and we really have to express that we cannot um, provide you with access to any of the AA members, or please stop recording. Okay, or any photographs, okay. so. But what about an interview about AA safety and what AA is doing to warn its members and the public about what's going on with sexual predation in AA? No, no interviews. I'm sorry. Well, so beside the interview, uh, you want, what is Alcoholics Anonymous doing to prevent some of the stuff that's going on with AA um, safety? If we can just ask you to leave, we would really like that very much. And thank you for stopping by. It's really, really interesting. The letters that I'm getting and the phone calls Ms. Richardson. with sexual predation is so, so bad. If at any level we need you to go, and if you're not going to go, we okay. will have yeah. security no, from I'm the building come walk you out. I'm going to go. I'm okay. going to go. But All right. Thank you. There's people that really love AM that want things to become safer. Okay. So that's one woman to another. If you guys can start to do something that's really proactive instead of passive, it would be great. Thank you. confronted his daughter's boyfriend who was convicted of smothering her three years ago. Pat and Paul, a judge put it very bluntly inside this courthouse today when he said to a convicted killer, you're done. Look, Eddie Air, Eddie Air, this is my daughter. Hector Mendez held up a picture of his daughter as a child playing the accordion to confront Eric Earl during the victim impact statements before Earl's sentencing. 
A jury convicted him last month for the first-degree murder of his girlfriend, Carla Brada, after a medical examiner determined she was smothered to death. Carla Brada's family wanted him to know who it is that's suffering most. You not only murder the love of my life, my child, my daughter, you hurt her whole family. Carla Brada's family is now suing Eric Earl as well as Alcoholics Anonymous claiming that the group and its sponsors failed to protect her from a man with a violent past. We are live in San Fernando, Jeff Nguyen, CBS2 News.